Good evening, my brothers and sisters, and welcome again to Lessons from the Cutting Room Floor. I am so delighted that you've taken the time to be a part of Bible study with us, to jump in, and to study God's Word, to see what the Lord is doing in our midst. God is doing some great and mighty things, and we can only praise Him and thank Him for what He's doing. Last week was Thanksgiving, and we blessed so many families. It blows my mind at what the church was able to rally to do, and now we're in the Christmas season getting ready to bless families for Christmas. But let me share something with you before we open in prayer and get started. Let me remind you, this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday, what, this coming Sunday, we are having communion and our Christmas concert at 3 o'clock. Morning service will be at 9. Then we're going to have dinner after service here. You come, you're welcome to come have dinner with us. And then we're coming back upstairs for the concert at 3 o'clock. Our choir has been rehearsing since summer to be ready for this. The orchestra, we have a 34, a 34, 35 piece orchestra that's going to be with us. So we want all of you present. They have planned, oh my God, and worked. And we want to be in the house to glorify God and to celebrate the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. So meet me here Sunday, this coming Sunday. And listen, our church has adopted hundreds of families for Christmas. I'm not talking about New Psalmist has adopted hundreds of families. I'm talking about the families in New Psalmist have chosen families to be a blessing to. Back in April, children in Zambia chose us to be with them. And now, it's Christmas time, we're choosing families all over the Baltimore region that we can bring Christmas to. Their toys, their food, gifts for the parents, for everybody in the family. And I'm just so delighted at what God is doing and making happen. Sunday, we had an outpouring of family support, person signing up to be there for families. So pray our strength in what we're doing. And on the 9th, families will be coming to New Psalmist to receive their toys and their gifts. So be in prayer for us as we do this massive work for the kingdom. Just a couple of announcements on December the 15th, that's a Friday night. We're having a church-wide family movie night. We want you to wear your ugly sweaters and your, ugly, and your, pajam your Christmas pajamas and be out. We're going to have concessions all over the site, movies for families, for children, everything going on. Just a fun night at the church. Fun night at the church. I love to see your face in the place. I'll be here. My family will be here. Pastor Thomas and his family will be here. We want to see all of you here for family night, Christmas family movie night right here. And then on the 17th, that Sunday, we're having our Christmas bazaar. Our fellowship hall will be transformed into a marketplace. You'll be able to get everything you need to get for Christmas in the sense of the major crafts and other things that our vendors will be here presenting. We hope you'll come out and be a part of it. We have a few vendor spots left. If so, you can go online to our website, www.newsalmist.org or newsalmist.churchcenter.com, or you can call us here at 410-945-3000. It's going to be off the chain. Christmas Eve will be in worship. Yes, but it'll be virtual. We have a Christmas special that's going to be a blessing in your homes. We want all the families and everyone to gather, maybe around 7 o'clock. If you have children, before the children go to bed, invite some of your friends over and share with us this Christmas special. We believe it will be a real treat for you. Um, God just helped us put it together now. Thanks to our production team for making such a marvelous presentation for Christmas. It'll air again on Christmas Day. Then on watch night, We'll be in this room at 6.30. We'll be in church for our watch night season or New Year's Eve, Christmas, New Year's Eve service. So that's our whole month in a nutshell. And I'm believing by faith it's going to be rich and rewarding. So now let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, the hour has come and now is. We ask your grace as we study your word. Lead us and guide us 
in the truth that you would have us understand. And we'll give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to the seventh chapter of Matthew. Seventh chapter of Matthew. And let's slip down to verses 28 and 29. Those are the frame of reference. We're dealing with the ministry of Jesus as he's going forth in Galilee, preaching and teaching, doing miracles, sharing with people. But it's all about, as much as we read his narrative and study his epic adventure and look at the odyssey that was uniquely his, this is really about, these stories and this gospel is really about the impact that Jesus had on individuals and how they experienced him and what that experience did for them. Quiet as it's kept, it's about what the experience is doing for us. What the experience of knowing God, of being in the family of God, of being heirs and joint heirs with Jesus is doing for us. For the solid year now, we've been working from the theme experiencing God. My aim and effort has been for you to experience God for yourself and to see the explosion that goes on inside of you as a result of having been with the Lord. It's radical and it is transformative. What's interesting as we look at this text, and I get to share with you in Bible studies, things I didn't get to share in the sermon. If we go all the way back to Genesis, Genesis talks about God walking in the cool of the day and meeting up and communing with man. In fact, when Adam and Eve sin and they run, they run and hide because they see and hear God coming in the cool of the day, walking through the garden. And the Bible says they ran and hid and God called them and said, why are you hiding? They said, because we are naked and we, we are ashamed. God said, who told you who you were naked? Who told you you were in this condition? Something had happened, and they were running and hiding. They had listened to the serpent, and the serpent had beguiled them and messed with their mind. And now they were troubled about being able to experience, share an experience with God, or be with God, because they knew something was now wrong in the relationship. See, the idea and the implication was that in the beginning, there was fellowship and communion when we experienced God. In fact, in the cool of the day, in other words, God reserved a time when he just shared himself with them. But here's what's interesting. As religion institutionalized, the real spiritual, vibrant, personal connection was often lost and has been lost as it became safer to keep the rules than to build the personal relationship. We're never going to get caught in this again. We're, we're just going to do what's right. We're not going to know him. We're just going to do the right thing. We're not going to make this mistake twice. In fact, for many, the relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, has been and still is defined by just keeping the rules. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't carouse, I don't run around. Therefore, I must be in right relationship with God. You might be, but are you experiencing God? My car may be well put together. It may have just come from the shop. It may have had an oil change. It may have had spark plugs changed. It may have had a tune-up. may even have brand new tires. But that doesn't mean I'm experiencing the ride. That just means I've done everything to maintain the healthiness of my car. It doesn't mean that I'm experiencing the joy or the benefit of my car. So it is with God. So it is for many with God. They have spent so much time 
keeping the rules that they have forgotten. It's about experiencing the relationship. It's like the man who thinks he's a good husband and a good provider because he pays all the bills, keeps a roof over everybody's head. That's true. He does do that. But there's more to being a good husband than paying the bills. Or, or the woman who feels she's a, a, a good wife and mother because she cooks and cleans and she does those things that are necessary. They're doing deeds, but not developing the depth of the relationship. Jesus has come that we might get beyond the superficial and discover, discover what comes along with being in his company and sharing moments with him. Like, but yet many people in the first century, the people of this century, are looking for more than what the scribes and the teachers had to offer. Many people are looking for more than what church has to offer. When all church has to offer is, let's do this, do this, do that. I was in a church not long, or some time ago, where the big issue was over whether they were going to change this in the worship service and replace it with that. It, it was all over formality. It was all about, uh, do we, we've been doing this for years. This is the way it should be done. But it had nothing to do with what it does when we do it. Does it draw me closer to Christ? I was in a worship service a few weeks ago for a church that was celebrating its anniversary. It um, is meeting in another facility, not, even, not their own facility, but another's facility. It was not jam-packed. The roof, the roof was not coming off with people, but there were the right amount of people in there. But all the experience of being in that room with those saints, I wish I could have stayed all day. Why? Because it was creating in me what I wanted created. And to simply define it, it was a good feeling. But it wasn't just feeling. It was a feeling that reaffirmed and reinforced the faith, the facts of faith that I hold dear. It wasn't just the feeling. It was something that reinforced the facts of my faith that keep me going. I hope you got that. I hope you got that. See, people are looking for this dynamic encounter our vision is that we are leading people, intentionally leading people, into a dynamic, engaging, and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. That we're leading them into a dynamic, engaging, and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's transformative. People want that. They don't want to just sit in church and sing a song and wave their hand. They want to leave like the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Did not our hearts burn within us? They want more than what's on the paper, more than what's planned in the back room, more than what the choir rehearsed. They want to feel the presence of the Lord. They want that experience, that life-changing, transformative presence of Jesus Christ. Now, yes, there are many people who think there is no God at all. That's just hogwash. Pastor, I don't even know why you're on there talking that tonight. You know, anybody really looking for all of that? No, but here's the reality. Two things I want to say. You may not be looking for that, but then what are you looking for? You must be looking for something that has more lifespan than you. I don't want to believe that when I die and close my eyes, all that was me is gone. Oh, yes, I may leave something lingering in history's memory, but I want to believe there's something left in the vitality of that which is me. And I get that from being in his presence, in the presence of the one who lived, died, and rose again and says to me, in my father's house are many mansions. 
I want to believe that there is more to life than this. And what I found is that that old aphorism is still true. There ain't no, fo- no atheist in the foxhole. People who don't believe in God don't believe in him until they are down to the wire and they have no one else and they cry out, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. See, the pearl of life will make you move beyond your constructs and it will teach you and reach for you and it will reach for a hope that empowers you to have a life in this life. See, the experience of Jesus Christ lets me know that my life is bigger than the life I'm living. But it also equips me for the most, for the most amazing journey in this life. I'm on my way to some place, but I've got something I'm doing and dealing with and enjoying while I'm in this place. And I must admit, write this down in the chat. I want life in this life. I want life in this life. A life that is, see, we live a life in a life that is marked by murder, by hatred, iniquity, inequity, bullying, scapegoating, crime, sickness, disease, suffering. Do I need to keep going? I want life. I want to feel alive, hopeful, excited, free, happy, strong, and filled with power. And like those persons seated in front of Jesus in chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, we sit in his church and we are like they were right now experiencing Christ for ourselves. I want to experience him in this life. I want this life in this life. I want this life of hope, of happiness, of excitement, of freedom, of strength, of power in this life marked by murder, intrigue, bullying, scapegoating, crime, disease, sickness, suffering. I want this in this. I want to be a witness in this. I want to have that, and that comes from experiencing Christ. See, for a whole lot of people, religion is nothing more than don't do this and don't do that. It it is the little child who is deemed a good child for keeping the rules but still never has the joy of fellowship and connection. Far too many people have missed having that talk with Jesus that can, that, how do I say this? That can, or that is the difference between life and existence. Let me say that again. Too many people have missed having that talk with Jesus that can be the difference between life and existing, life and existence. Life is vibrant. Existence is going through the motion. Life is motivated and inspirational. Existence is depression and dull. With Christ, we face the difference between the rat race and the victory lap of of life. So the text says, at Matthew chapter 5, because this is the concluding section of the Sermon on the Mount. We are dealing with the concluding sections of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching and he's blowing the folks' mind. It all started when he called his disciples. He went up on a mountain, called his disciples to him. That's chapter 5, verse 1. And they sat down and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and as he taught them, they sat there and absorbed it. But they weren't the only ones listening. There was a crowd assembling, a crowd. There's something about the presence of God when it's present 
people start showing up and they started experiencing Christ. They started experiencing Christ. Look at that, that passage. It's, it's amazing how Matthew puts it in this ex-tax collector who's experienced Christ. Remember now, Matthew is the tax collector who sat at the seat of customs collecting money. But Jesus said to him, follow me. And he dropped everything and started following Jesus in hope of discovering life in his life. In him was life and the life that's what John says of Jesus, in him was light. In him was life. And that light lighted in every heart and lit everything up. By him was everything made. He creates life in us. He gives us the hope that we need to have to be able to live. And so when we jump up to this verse, when he had finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at his teaching, surprised. They were surp they, in fact, they were blown away because they had never heard anyone talk like this. They stuck around. Now notice, Jesus wasn't just talking and they heard him. He was up on a mountain. They came to hear him. I need somebody to write this down. I come for God to blow me away. I come for God to blow me away. I come for God to put me at, there was a song we used to sing when I was growing up. I'm up on cloud nine. I come for God to put me on cloud nine. I come for God to, to wipe me out. I come to stagger away from his presence. Listen, when was the last time that was your intent? Before he opened his mouth, before he said a word, before the choir sang, before you got good in your seat, you got up and got dressed and said, I come for God to blow me out the water. I come for him to meet me and minister. Why? Because my need is that great. The greater the need, the greater the supply of God. The lower I'm down, the more God has to pick me up. The more something has hurt me, the more God has to heal me. Wherever I am, God has to bring that plus more. Y'all getting what I'm saying? Listen to how the disciples, or rather how the text says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, all of these major statements, blessed are the poor in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And when you pray, pray like this. No man lights a light and puts it under a bushel, but he lights it and puts it up on a candlestick that it might give light to every place. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its favor for what good is it? You are the light of the world. All of these statements Jesus has been making, teaching, and folk have come to hear them, and they are hanging on every word, blown away by it. Why? Because they came to be blown away. Y'all didn't get it. They came for this. Because we're living in a different age, and because we're living in an age where religion has become more do's than being, folks think, well, if I just do this, if I'm here, if I, you know, I'm in church, I, I came to the service, I'm gone. No, you don't just come to church. You come to experience God. You come to experience Christ, and you come for him to blow you away. They hang on every word he, saw, he said. They were hanging on every word he spoke. They were caught up with that message and that move of his. They could, they were being blown away, but that's what they came for. What do you go to church for? What do you go into your private praying closet for? What do you go into your devotional moment for? Just a word. Or do you go in to encounter the risen Christ? To have your cup overflow. To have your heart washed 
with the peace of the living God, to have your mind quieted, to have your strength renewed like the eagle. What do you go for? You know, we, we, we sit, look at our watch. Oh, I've been here longer than if I got to go. I got somewhere to go. And, and you miss what he has for you. You miss. Those who left after the, the Beatitudes missed all the other great instructive pieces. Those who left before the benediction missed the last words of final instruction. My brothers and my sisters, this is about encountering him. And the crowd that is out there saw him go up on a mountain and call his disciples, but they weren't leaving because they wanted it too. I need you to write in the chat, I want a piece of this. I, want, I don't just want the preachers and the deacons to get it. I don't just want the members of the prayer warrior crowd to get it. We have prayer warriors who gather every morning at 630. They gather every morning at 630 and pray for the health and healing of the church, for membership, for the pastor and family. They pray for you. And they experience God and their days are absolutely awesome. But I don't want them to be the only ones that have that. I want it too. I want to experience that too. I want God to meet me with that too. I want to feel his presence. I want to know he's coming to where I am. Because see, what they sensed as they listened. Remember, everything has a context. So Jesus is teaching his disciples and there's a large crowd around him. What is the context? The context is the Romans are le holding on to the world. Ju Judaism is just a second-rate religion. The people of Palestine and the people of Jerusalem and the folk of Galilee and all of the Jewish lands are nobodies in the eyes of the Romans. They, they carry no great power. They have no great importance. They are not deemed as major and significant people. They are barely making it, uh, eking out a living, trying to survive. And here's this carpenter from Galilee, penniless person, who's telling them, your heavenly father knows which, consider the lilies of the field, how they neither toil nor they spin. Yet your heavenly father knows what they have need of. Are you not worth more than these? Will your heavenly father not take care of you? I mean, he's teaching them and talking to them and it's blowing their mind because they're living in a context where they've been afraid where they've been afraid of life and afraid of consequences and afraid they can't cut it. I need somebody to write in the chat. I know about that. I know about that fear. I know about that fear. It's based on, as Tony Robbins said, it's based on false evidence appearing real. That's what fear, false evidence appearing real. We believe the primal lie that God is mad with us and will not deal with us. And that if there is a God, he's already written us off. He left us long ago. That's a barefaced lie. He woke me up this morning and started me on my way. So I, with the blood running warm in my veins, he's very much alive. That's a lie. He is with us. And so we're afraid. We have so much fear in our lives. We don't call it fear sometimes. Sometimes we just talk about, I'm just trying to be safe. I'm just trying to make sure I've got everything secured. But most of us are worried that there's a hole in the bucket. Most of us are worried there's a leak in the roof. Most of us are worried that we might not have the resources necessary to go the long haul. But Jesus Christ is that resource. And the interesting thing is in his company, in his company, what we began to feel and to know is a sense of safety. In his company, in his presence, we began to feel and discover a freedom from that fear. And he replaces it with a confidence in deliverance and development. I, I, I dropped that Sunday and I don't think I got a chance to really explore it to the depths that I would want to. But think about it, that's what Jesus, our encounter with Jesus, our moment with him, our, our experience of him, gives us freedom from fear. Because not only does he show us we can do it, he shows us we'll do it with him by our side. He shows us, he's prima facie evidence that God is real. 
that the victory is not only possible, it will happen. That if you put your trust in the Lord, he will not fail you. He will bring you through. He replaces our doubts. As they sat at the foot of that mountain, he replaced their doubts with confidence and deliverance. And somebody said, well, Pastor, where do you get this from this line? And the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. He taught as somebody who had authority. He helped them realize that his presence is always a match for their problems. My problems sometimes overwhelm me until I bring in Jesus. Sometimes I bring him in to think with me. Sometimes he comes in to sit with me. Sometimes he comes in to fight for me. Sometimes he comes in to carry me. But he always comes in. He always comes in. I do not know always which role he will play in the problem that I face. No, somebody said, well, he comes in so you can say, no, I can't solve all my problems. Sometimes he has to solve them. There are some things I can't fix. He has to fix them. And he does. He steps in. And he makes it right. And in doing so, he enlarges my testimony. This is where we shout and praise him because we've discovered that his presence is always a match for our problem. Our problems come at us. Get this, write this in the chat. But his presence is in with us. My problems come at me. His presence comes in me. He is defense and offense at the same time. He is with us to the end of the age, and he is the power revealed and released in our lives. He's with us to the end of the age, and the power released and revealed in our lives. He takes our fears because he builds the connection with us, and then his confidence flows into us. His confidence, not mine. My confidence, somebody said, oh, you're so confident. No, baby, I'm working on his. I'm working on his. One of the lines I would say to people when they were really acting as if they couldn't make it, I say, listen, borrow some of my faith. I borrow Christ Jesus' faith and confidence every day that no matter what, the victory shall be ours. See, Christ's presence overcomes our fears. It overcomes and it empowers us to succeed and to grow and to become. See, you'll never, never succeed if you allow that fear to grip you. But his presence builds the connection with us and his confidence flows in us. Now get this, Christ, this is, this is what experiencing God is all about. It's about recognizing his confidence flowing in you until it starts to flow out from you. Out from you in your actions, your words and deeds, out from you in the way you pour it on to other people. See, that is the whole experience of the disciples. In fact, this is what we mean by the process of sanctification. The Christ who we love cements the connection he has with us. And then the Spirit flows into us, giving us the confidence we need to know that we are about to become the will of God made manifest in the earth. His presence creates the connection and his confidence flows through that connection into us. And it did that for his disciples until Pentecost broke loose. See, Pentecost is the full manifestation and they came forth in power. Tell somebody close to you, my confidence is building. It ain't there yet. But it's building. Right in the chat, my confidence is building. But I'm not stopping until I believe that all things are possible. I'm not stopping 
until I believe all things are building. No, my confidence is not where it ought to be, but I'm not stopping until it gets to where it needs to be, until I believe all things are possible. See, you can't change the world or defeat the forces that hold back our people and others until we reach this point and know we will have life in this life. And we will teach others to have life in this life until we have eternal life. See, his presence gives me deliverance. But it's also the source of my development and your development. He spoke as one with authority. See, those who heard the master were ready now to grow into the men and women who could reflect the image of God in their lives as Christ did in his. What was blowing them away was he was speaking with so much authority. He wasn't appealing to authority. He wasn't calling on authority. He spoke as if he was authority. He had the authority to say everything he was saying. And God sent me to tell you that when you experience him, his authority begins to rest, rule, and abide in you. As his presence fills you, his authority gives you authorization to be his witness in the world. As his spirit fills you, as his spirit takes over in you, as the confidence of Christ builds in you, you and I begin to develop. Those that heard the master were ready to grow. They were ready to go forward. And let me look at somebody right now. Type while I talk. This is your season of development. In fact, type it this way. This is my season of development. There is something. Uh oh. There, and that's why these people were listening to him. Because he was making alive in them that this was their season. You know, sometimes you know it's your season, but you don't want to deal with it because you don't have all the resources. You can't make it happen. But something about him made them claim it. And let me help somebody understand something. There is something that you and I are each individually dealing with that has been reserved for right now. It's been reserved for us to tackle right now. Everybody has something that is reserved for you to tackle right now, that every teaching is talking to, every song is seemingly addressing. Every place you go, every conversation has a, a hint of it in it because this is a season of development. It's a season of development. There's something that's going on that's reserved for right now for you to tackle right now. God didn't put it in front and center of your life two years ago or five years ago. You may have known it, but you have not been able to tackle it until now. But when we are experiencing God, there are some things in our growth, now get this, that are for right now. You were talking about it, complaining about it five years ago, but it wasn't for right now. You were talking about it, complaining about it two years ago, but you didn't do nothing with it, nothing came of it. But right now, it's hitting you like it hasn't hit before. Let Christ do his perfect work. Let Christ work on that something. Because this is the season it is destined to change. Wasn't destined to change two years ago, five years ago? It wasn't integral piece of the puzzle for then. It is an integral piece of the puzzle for now. It was not to change in 2010. It was not to be eradicated from your personality in 2022. It is to be addressed and tackled and dealt with now that Christ is present in your life in a new affirming way, in a new affirming way that's radically transforming your life. It is for right now. Somebody write in that chat, right now, right now. This is for right now. 
See, let the fear be replaced with confidence and watch how you overcome and make a difference with the very thing that was holding on to you. Christ is addressing some things in your life right now, in your, in your space right now, and he's affirming you and fixing it in an amazing way. They stood there saying, he speaks as one with authority. He's addressing what's happening in me now, but he's addressing it now not to educate me, but to help me eradicate it. See, some of us are only at the stage of being educated in our problem, not at the point of being eradicated. Two years ago, God may have educated it to you. Christ may have made you aware of it, and you went, oh. Now, he's working on it with you, trying to eradicate it. And how's he doing it? He's taking out your fear. He's putting in his confidence in you. And as you stand, you are now willing to be developed by the very thing you know God is calling to be transformed. They were amazed. The, the other teachers of the law were always quoting some other authority. They were always referring to some other authority. They were deferring to another authority. But no, he spoke with authority. It, it's the, the, the example of this is the person who basing at somebody. Well, well, the boss said do such and such when the person rises back up at him. Well, the boss told me to tell you. Supervision said I was supposed to come down here and tell you. They have to appeal to authority when something jumps back at them. But then every now and then somebody will jump back and say, you're going to do it because I said so. And they just hop on up and keep on doing what they're supposed to do because they realize the sound of authority. Authority has a certain sound. I heard it in my mom and my daddy's voice. I knew they had authority, and I had to act right now. See, in the presence of Christ, when I experience him, when I feel his presence and his touch, not only am I filled with confidence, but I have a new understanding of my own life. These guys say, the people who are leaving in this text, they stand there saying they were amazed. In a latter passage, in one of the Gospels, they'll say, we were, they, they were amazed and astonished because he speaks as one with authority. They say that to each other. He speaks as somebody with authority. We are overwhelmed by who he is and what he does because he speaks as one with authority. Do you speak with authority? Is there enough of Christ flowing in you that you can say, it's not I, but Christ who lives in me? When you speak, does your voice have the sound of heaven in it? When you speak, does your voice echo the power and the steadfastness of God? Do you speak as if you have the right to control this? Jesus, in a little passage later in chapter 8, will say, and I preached on it not long ago, peace be still. Do you have the authority in your voice to control things? Do you have the power to control things? Do, do, are you identified as having the right to be in charge? Oh, yeah. He, she, they know what they're talking about. They are in charge. And God has picked this moment for you to work on certain things. You know, say, well, it's been bad. My marriage has been bad for years. But, yeah, but this is the moment God's picked for you to work on it. Five years ago, you worked on it, you probably would have resolved it. Five years ago, two years ago, you worked on it, one of you might have been in jail. Three years ago, you worked on it, you, you might would have acquiesced and given in. You worked on it when you were supposed to work on it. When you worked on it with God's confidence flowing in you and not your fear rising up around you. God gives you confidence of the outcome. Some relationships had to end. 
and God gave you confidence that it would end and you would survive. Some relationships are meant to last and God gave you confidence that you could overrule whatever your mind was telling you and that he would build a bridge between good times and make you able to live and laugh again. God has you working on something at the right moment. He speaks to somebody who's talking directly to us. He has the authority to speak all of these circumstances that are in our lives into our life and to give us clarity and understanding and, and to make, it make sense of this stuff that makes no sense for us. Wow. He lets me see in my life what I am missing in my life. See, when you're encountering Christ, when you're experiencing Christ, no matter how good your life is, you realize you ain't got it all. There's a level of laughter you don't have. There's a level of joy you don't have. There's a level of peace you don't have. All of the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, loving kindness, long-suffering, there's all of that. You realize you may have it, but you don't have it all. You, you, you don't have it at the level Jesus does. You can't look at your problems and know you will survive. You can't say the winds and waves, peace be still. You can't get to the problem that is the insurmountable one and stay in the garden for an hour and pray. Help me, somebody. See, the whole Sermon on the Mount is geared to help you and I see our lives differently, to see what we're missing. We always think our lives are constrained, that something is holding me back, that I can't get to where I need to go. This one piece is out of place in my life. I don't know how many people I thought I've met who've acted as if spirituality was out of place in their lives. It, it, it won't fit in my life. You haven't experienced Christ yet. Because you see, in experiencing Christ, you realize what you're missing in life, and Christ shows you how to make it fit in your life. You see, the, the crowd that was coming out that day were having problems and issues with giving and judging and praying, witnessing, being poor, struggling to make it. Jesus, however, shows them that they don't have to focus on doing what they think is right. You know, I, I've got to do all these right things. I can't smoke, can't drink, can't carouse, can't do this, can't do that. Jesus says, don't focus on that. I want you to focus on being who you think I created you to be, who you think I gave you life to become. And when you do that, when you focus on that, you don't even have to worry, you'll do right. You'll do right when you focus on being right, being the right kind of person, being the loving person, being the gentle person, being the person who cares about others. When you care about others, you'll watch what you say. I know folk who want the church to be this and that, but my God, when you hear them talk to you, you say to yourself, I don't want to be a part of that church. People there are mean. I look at some things we do now that we could not do in the early years of ministry. The reason we couldn't do them then was not because we didn't have the resources. We hadn't grown to see life like that. But oh, now we have grown. Everyone is struggling with their money, but we bought toys and clothes for children. We sponsored children from Africa. We go to the farm and we pick food to feed hungry families. We find answers to big questions by allowing ourselves to challenge ourselves to become the person Christ is forming in us. That's what it means to experience Christ, to allow yourself, to allow yourself, to challenge yourself to become the person that Christ is forming you into. That, that's why this crowd is going away with their minds blown because he speaks as one with the authority to have the kind of life we miss having, to have the kind of life we have not found the key for. And he says, hang with me, and I will not only give you the key, I will create for you the life. I will surround the life around you until the life comes in you and takes up residency in you.
And the Bible, listen to what the verse says. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one with authority and not as their teachers of the law. He didn't appeal to this scripture, that scripture. He didn't appeal to this person or that person. He wasn't footnoting everything. He was speaking out of the largesse of his own relationship with God. And the people left witnessing to one to another, sharing the joy. I close on this note because time is up. Look at somebody say, time is up. I close on this. I close on this. See, when you experience Jesus, there's even a deeper truth of what happens. And it's simply this. His presence gives us what I like to call a cosmic community. All of a sudden, I began to realize I am a part of something so much bigger than myself. I feel the gentle breezes of the air. I feel the oneness of cosmic creation. I feel, as the song says, the presence of angels all around. I, I feel what holy ground is. I feel the joy of my brother, my sister seated beside me. When I enter his gates with thanksgiving, when I enter his courts with praise, I sing praises. I sing praises to our God because I'm a part of a cosmic community, a community of faith that never dies. See, this goes back to the very beginning. I began, I, I realized this cannot be the end because the connections that I made can't just, just evaporate and fade away and blow away like the, the pieces from a dandelion that has sprung open, but rather must live on in some shape and form, must make real that lesson of physics that matters neither created nor destroyed, it just changes its form. That when this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, I've got another building not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. So that even while I'm in time, I grab one hand into eternity and know that time will never hold me, but I will leave it to those in time and I will join those who are in eternity. That's what experiencing God does. It helps me experience all of the emotions that belong to the cosmic kingdom. It helps me know things I would not otherwise know because I'm connected to the spirit of the living Christ. It helps me to do what I never thought I could do because he equips me to make and makes me able to do all things. That's experiencing God. Experience. It's not just a word, not just a title. And they left amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who spoke it like he had the authority to say it. And they heard it as a man with authority. May today's lesson speak to you as having been spoken with authority. Well, our time is up. I hope today's lesson blessed your heart and spoke to your spirit. Remember all the things going on. You got to be here Sunday. You got to be here Sunday. Sunday morning at 9 is our morning worship. Then dinner. Then 3 o'clock we'll be back for the Lord's Supper service and our concert. The concert is going to be all in the communion service. Then we'll serve the supper. It's going to be off the chain. 12 months of the year, God has kept us alive and kept us going. I'm inviting everybody from everywhere. Lottie Daddy and everybody, meet us here Sunday. You don't have to be a member of New Psalmist. We want you in the place as a part of the cosmic community. Not everybody in God's family goes to New Psalmist. God's got people everywhere and folk we don't even know. We're inviting all of you to come with us. Fill this house up with us as we see what it is to be in the presence. As Rosalind was saying, in the presence of Jehovah, to be in his presence will change our lives. Well, let's get ready to give our offerings. 
Let's get ready to give our gifts. I'm going to pray us out. Don't forget our Christmas experiences that are going on. Go to our website and see all the things that are happening. Go on uh, newsarmist.churchcenter.com and sign up for all the things we're doing. But let's close in prayer now. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. But above all, we thank you for your presence. Oh, Lord, to be in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At his right hand are blessings forevermore. God, I love talking about experiencing you and being overshadowed by your joy and your peace and your calm. To feel my cup just running over and happiness flooding my soul. So I pray that for everyone that's on with us tonight. For all of those who are in their special and separate places, but who connect by way of the internet. And we're able to talk and chat one to another. Guide us, O oh thou great Jehovah. Help us to accept your will for our lives. God, we are hungry. We are hungry for your presence. Now bless new psalmists in this closing month of the year. Send us over the top. Help us to reach all of our goals. Father, help us to give like we've never given before. I pray for the brother, the sister right now who's giving their gift to this ministry their Christmas gift to this ministry. Lord, thank you for that gift. As we give our Christmas gifts to the ministry, we say bless your name. Thank you for Jesus who died our soul to save. Now, Lord, Lord, bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my brother, my sister. I want to thank all of those who are giving their, their gifts for Christmas, for New Psalmist giving their year-end gifts. We are so grateful. It helps us reach so many goals and do so many things. We want to be a blessing. So help us in this season. You can send your offerings to New Psalmist at 6020 Marion Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. You can use Givelify or PushPay. You can go to our website and give off of our website. And you can even text your offering to 77977. But at this end of the year, make a special gift to New Psalmist. If we've been blessing you, if this ministry has been important and impacting and empowering to you, then we ask you to give that we might do a greater work for God. When I look at the faces of the little children and chosen and to see the families that are helping them, when I... When I see the gifts that are coming into the church to help families, when I look around and see all that God is calling us to do and the strength that he is causing us to evoke in others, I know this is good ground. So let's give at the end of the year. And I want to be the first to say thank you for all of your gifts that you give to help new psalmists do all God's called us to do. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. God bless you, my friends. See you this weekend in the Word.